All right. Well, good morning. This is look at the crowd. We got a wonderful crowd here this morning at Friendly House. And it looks like we've got a good group. Uh, yes, we've got a good group of 18 and um, on Zoom. So uh, this is very well attended today. Just welcome, welcome all to the Humanists of Greater Portland Sunday morning lecture here at Friendly House. HTP believes very strongly in freedom of speech, but I must state that uh, the, re the views expressed by myself, our reader, today's speaker, HGP, members and guests are not the official views of the humanists of greater Portland. You're here at a humanist meeting and sim simple definition of humanism. Humanism is a philosophy informed by science, inspired by art and motivated by compassion. Humanists strive to lead meaningful and ethical lives and use reason and empathy to guide their decisions and actions. We live ethical lives because we honor the fact that this is the only life of which we are certain. As humanists, we affirm the dignity and worth of all people. We do this not only to acknowledge all that humanists, humans have accomplished in the arts and in science, but also simply for the possibility for peace and well being when people interact with each other respectfully. Joyce Lackey is our, our reader this morning. I chose this reading when the political situation was looking pretty dire. And <laughs> the mood is a little different now, yeah. but it, you can still hear about 13 surprisingly hilarious quotes from US presidents. This was compiled for a website called uh, inspiringquotes.com. George Washington once wrote, it is assuredly better to go laughing than crying through the rough journey of life. The first US president wasn't the only commander in chief to highlight the importance of humor. Dwight D. Eisenhower saw it as fundamental to the job saying, a sense of humor is part of the art of leadership, of getting along with people, of getting things done. Some presidents are known for their sense of humor, be it Lincoln's sarcasm, Reagan's endearing wit, or Obama's fondness for dad jokes. Others became known more for their gaffes and unintentional word salads, perhaps most notably George W. Bush and his Bushisms. Who could forget, they misunderestimated me. Here are some examples of quotes from US presidents who were deliberately trying to get a laugh. If I had to name my greatest strength, I guess it would be my humility. Greatness, greatest weakness, it's possible that I'm a little too awesome. <laughs> George, I'm sorry, Barack Obama. <laughs> yeah, you may recognize this one. Honestly, if I were two-faced, would I be showing you this one? Is that recognizable? Abraham Lincoln? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm not worried about the deficit. It's big enough to take care of itself. Ronald Reagan. How has retirement affected my golf game? A lot more people beat me now. <laughs> when we got into office, the thing that surprised me most was to find that things were just as bad as we'd been saying they were. <laughs> that was John F. Kennedy. Being president is like being a jackass in a hailstorm. There's nothing to do but stand there and take it. <laughs> Lyndon Johnson. Some, you'll know who this is. Some folks look at me and see a certain swagger. In Texas, we call it walking. <laughs> My esteem in this country has gone up substantially. It is very nice now when people wave at me, they use all their fingers. <laughs> Jimmy Carter has retired. <laughs> Being president is like running a cemetery. You've got a lot of people under you and nobody's listening. <laughs> that was Bill Clinton. <laughs> this one speaks for itself. No matter how tough it gets, I have no intention of becoming a lame duck president. Unless, of course, Cheney accidentally shoots me in the leg. <laughs> if one morning I walked on top of the water across the Potomac River, the headline that afternoon would read, President Can't Swim. <laughs> that was Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> 
I have left orders to be awakened at any time in case of national emergency, even if I'm in a cabinet meeting. <laughs> that was self-explanatory too. Okay. These days, I look in the mirror and I have to admit, I'm not the strapping young Muslim socialist that I used to be. Good old Barack. <laughs> Joyce, that was really fun. And thank you so much. That gave us a lot to laugh about. Who was the golf game president? Eisenhower. Yep. Thank you. Yep. All right. Well, we have a real treat today for a speaker. I can tell we've got a good crowd. So that's always a good indication that uh, our topic is uh, exceptional. Our topic today, mischievous creatures, mischievous creatures, the forgotten sisters who transformed early American science, incorporates the humanist commitments of critical thinking and social justice. Catherine McNeur, our speaker, is a professor of history at Portland State University, where she teaches courses on environmental history, the United States, food history, and public history. She is the author of two books, Taming Manhattan, Environmental Battles in the Antebellum City, and Mischievous Creatures, the Forgotten Sisters Who Transformed Early American Science. She has won numerous awards for her writing, including the American Society of Environmental Historians, George Perkins Marsh Prize, the Western, let me make sure I said, Western Association of Women's Historians, uh, Gitta Cot, uh, Chod Heary Prize, I may have mispronounced that, probably have, and the New York Society of Librarians uh, Hornblower Award, among others. Uh, Catherine, so glad that you're here with us this morning and really looking forward to this wonderful presentation. Okay. Thank, <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much for having me and thank you, Helen, for that lovely introduction. Um, so today I'm gonna talk to you about my book, um, Mischievous Creatures. Um, and it's a, it's a story of two women scientists from Philadelphia who um, were pretty much forgotten from history. And I, I stumbled upon them accidentally, and I'll get into that, that story a little bit more in a second. But um, basically they were two sisters. One, um, Margareta was an entomologist. Her sister Elizabeth was a botanist. And um, Margareta was one of the first women elected to the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She was elected the same year in 1850 as another, as an astronomer, Mariah Mitchell. Um, and she was also one of the first women elected to the Academy of Natural Sciences too. But despite that, the Despite the fact, you know, and those kinds of accolades typically lend itself to being one of the, the people on those lists of first women, these pioneers, these um, trailblazers, but she has been erased from history. And so I, um, after stumbling upon them, I was really interested in figuring out why, um, how had I never heard of these people? Um, how had I, I never come across them before? Um, but f first off, I would want to start with what uh, seems completely unrelated, which is the tree of heaven. I had actually, uh, this book about the science had not been my intention. Like I had not been, I had not set out to write a book about them. I had actually um, believed I was going to write my second book about the tree of heaven, which is a much hated, um, now it's deemed to be an invasive species. Um, and I, it has a long history of going in and out of style. It's a tree that grows in Brooklyn, that's the center of that, that um, novel and the movie that came out of that too. Um, and I had been looking into that tree for about two years. I had been working on a project about that tree um, and the kind of in and out and the way that China, racism against Chinese immigrants was tied into um, perceptions of that tree. Um, but I was at the uh, New York Historical Society for a meeting and I um, had a day to do some research there and um, spent some time uh, in the archives and the archivist said, oh, you should look at the papers of this botanist named William Darlington. Um, he wrote about this tree in a book about American weeds and you might uh, learn something you know, about, about the tree that way. And so I um, went and dug into the, what's called the finding aid, um, so basically a list of all the letters that are present in that collection and saw that there were 250 letters from a woman named Elizabeth Morris. And like anybody, um, it, was a, it was the largest collection of letters in his, his um, papers. And so I, like anybody, I, I, I had my laptop there and I Googled her. I was like, who is this Elizabeth Morris? Nothing came up. And I dug a little deeper and saw that her sister was this entomologist who had been elected to the Academy of Natural Sciences. I figured out that she was a botanist. 
the next month I was um, giving a talk at MIT and I had a day to do research again, uh, and um, this time at, at Harvard's Library of Zoology and was looking up, still following my track of that tree, I um, was looking up uh, stuff about the, these drop worms that had infested all American trees in the 1850s, but not the Ailanthus tree. So looking at this entomologist papers, and lo and behold, I stumble upon letters from Margaret Morris, the entomologist, and her letters really stopped me in my tracks. She wrote that um, it was clear that she was having some kind of battle with other entomologists of the time period, and she um, was writing to this, what, what I would call a frenemy of some sort, like she was trying to make friends with this guy, but he was one of her antagonists really, somebody who had been targeting her. And she, she but she wrote, I, um, I've panted for the sympathy of someone who could appreciate my love of the science and look past the fact that she was a woman, look past the fact that she didn't have access to the university libraries that other entomologists had. Um, and I, I, that night I went to dinner with a friend who, who teaches in Boston and I was like, I think I'm putting this tree book aside. These women keep following me um, from archive to archive. Um, and I, I wanna learn more about them and figure out who they were. At that point, if you Googled their names, they didn't even have photographs on the internet. You know, you can come up with like Google images of almost anything. They had nothing. Um, uh, it, was, it was, they were truly a race. There were some um, historians of science who had uh, minor, like a, a sentence here, a sentence there about um, their membership, but there wasn't really a lot of information about them out there. It wasn't much for historians of science, science to really come across until very recently. Um, so these are the women. These are the portraits that, that were at the University of Delaware. I kind of dug in and found, found images of them. That's Margareta on the left and Elizabeth on the right. And as I said, Margareta was the entomologist. Elizabeth is, um, was the botanist. And what's interesting to me about studying two sisters like that, they, they're um, born two years apart. They had other siblings too, some, um, some of whom married um, uh, a brother who went on to become a lawyer, things of that nature. But um, these two women, they were married. They lived together their entire lives. Um, they had exactly the same background. They had the same tutors. They had the same wealth, the same library. They shared a laboratory, which was in the, the, the top floor of their home. And um, yet they took two very different directions with their careers. And that's sort of, that's, you know, the way that we look at um, the psychologists or whatever who look at twins as a way to kind of make sense of what's nurture and what's nature. You you can because of the fact that they took two different paths with the, of their their careers. You can get a sense of what was possible for women scientists of this era with these privileges that they had, and they had plenty of privileges. They came from a wealthy family. Um, they're from the Morris family. If you go to Philadelphia or New Jersey, the Morris name is everywhere. Morris Town, Morris Street. Every their their grandfathers and great uncles were mayors and governors and everything like that. So they, they were well connected um, to the elite society of Philadelphia at the time. Um, but all that aside, the, the, they, they, their careers went in two different paths. Margareta, this first, you know, first uh, woman elected to these multiple organizations, um, had a very public career. She decided to elbow her way into debates about um, entomology and agricultural entomology. Specifically, um, she was interested in pests. Most Entomologists of this time period were, were more interested in looking for exotic beetles and other kinds of creatures that had never been named before. She was interested in solving um, agricultural problems. That, uh, agricultural entomology was really just getting its start at this time period. There were some, but it was kind of a, it was seen as almost a lower status form of entomology. Um, so it was harder for um, some of the men who were in that field to make their name. And that's part of the, the, their insecurity is part of the reasons why they, they kind of fought with her. I'll get into more too. But um, so she had a very public career. Margareta or Elizabeth, excuse me, the botanist on the right side here, she, on the other hand, did not want that kind of publicity. She wanted to have a much more private career. She was um, supportive of other scientists working behind the scenes. She was friends with Asa Gray, the um, Harvard botanist who was friends with Charles Darwin, a kind of major figure of the time period. She helped him a lot. She helped write his lectures. She edited his um, textbooks for him. She illustrated things for lots of different people. Um, she was working, uh, she con connected people behind the scenes to just kind of building networks, sort of soft skills um, and the things that we would in later years deem to be women's work um, too. Both of these women were both very um, 
talented artists too. Um, on the cover of the book, there's paintings around the, the edges of it, and that's all of their botanical and entomological art um, that they, they did. So um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about their careers and um, how, how they stepped into the public and then how they were erased over time. So Margareta, um, when she was in her 40s, uh, became very interested in an outbreak of um, Hessian flies. Uh, this is in the 1836 and 1837, 1838. There were um, uh, Hessian flies, which are wheat flies, devastating fields of wheat all up and down the East Coast of the United States. And um, the Hessian fly had been originally named by one of her tutors, Thomas Say. And it, he had um, originally seen these flies in the uh, fields across the street from where M Margareta Morris lived. There was this, this house, it still exists, the Wick House um, on the side there. It's a historic home now and they have a beautiful rose garden. Um, but it was a, a major site for scientists of this era who would come in and, and visit the, um, the, the Haynes family that lived there. And Margareta Morris and Elizabeth Morris were often there too. Anyway, their wheat field was infested with these Hessian flies and Margareta was just interested in the puzzle. She'd never seen one herself. She wanted to go out and see it. She wanted to observe and see what her, she had only read about um, up until that point. And so she went to the fields to see the Hessian fly and watch its behavior. And what she saw was that it was behaving much more, much differently, uh, far differently than what her tutor had said and described in the official description of the Hessian fly, the Cecidomia oh. destructor. So um, she found that it wasn't laying its egg in the same place that her, that Thomas Say had said. And um, instead of laying it inside the leaf, she, it was laying its egg by the seeds or the, or the wheat seeds. Um, and she knew that if this was, this was a main, and I would say the wheat infestation was a huge deal at this time period. This is the, the panic of 1837 is happening around now. This is, um, and that has to do with real estate speculation and all other kinds of economic changes of that time period. But wheat prices were going up markedly because of these infestations. Um, a, a barrel of wheat um, was down twice the price that it had been, and there were there were riots in, in the streets of New York um, uh, about the price of wheat and, and bread. Um, so solving this problem was a, a big deal. And so that's what she was interested in, just kind of helping. She told her cousin who happens to be a, or happened to be a um, chemistry professor at University of Pennsylvania, um, Robert Hare, tells him about it. And he's like, you need to tell people, we have to, to present this to the American Philosophical Society. This is a major scientific association. Um, we have to tell them so that they can also share that information with farmers. And she was like, no, 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 I don't want to go public. She knew that she'd be attacked if she did. And so she, she demurred. Um, and then the next year, there was another infestation and she continued to go out into the fields. Um, farmers were distraught, but scientists, uh, entomologists um, were excited about the fact that the infestation continued. And so they, she's, she's out there observing and sees that it's still doing that, still behaving in that way. And another year goes by and she's, each year her, her cousin is saying, we gotta present this. We have, to, we have to tell the public about this. And she kept hesitating. And then finally in 1840, and that's the headline that you see on the top of the slide here, she does. She allows her cousin, who's a member of the American Philosophical Society. And at this point, really only men were present in those meetings. There was no official rule that women could not be um, uh, members, but if, by de facto, it was true that all only men were, were in those rooms. And she, um, she gives a report to her cousin. Her cousin presents it. They have an early form of peer review go on. There's a group of scientists who analyze her findings and then decide, yes, we're going to publish this. Um, it takes years, though, to publish. It's still true of academic publishing. And you try to publish something in a journal, it takes forever. But that was true in 1842. And so they, uh, they um, published an abstract of it first, and then in the transactions, and then or in the proceedings, and then in the transactions, they have the, the longer form, but that happens in 1843. And so what, hap what they decide to do is um, one of the members of that peer review committee decides he's going, or they, they task him with presenting this to farmers. And there were all these agricultural journals of the time period that were essentially public popular science journals um, uh, that, that were distributed and people you know, widely read both in cities and in, in the in countryside. It wasn't just farmers reading them, but anybody interested in agriculture generally. And so he writes a very long form 
article about her findings and takes a lot of liberties. If her article that, or like her report to the American Philosophical Society was say 300 words, his was a thousand words. And so he took a lot of liberties in describing things and phrased things in ways he himself was not an entomologist by specialty. He phrased things, and he was good spirited with it, and but he was very condescending to farmers. And he, um, again, just took some liberties and things that Margareta would have never said. And then after he publishes this in the agricultural journals, people rein in and critique her. This woman does not know what she's talking about. She clearly doesn't know what she saw. She's confusing this kind of fly with that kind of fly. Even the agricultural entomologist, the one papers are at Harvard who I stumbled upon her letters and they were like, oh, this woman is reviving an old debate. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She was devastated by this. She cut out every critique about this because she had done this only for public. She had nothing to gain. She was not a wheat farmer herself. It was only doing this to help other people. Um, uh, and she was interested in the debate, but they they were criticizing her without giving her um, her due or, or really even looking at the specimens to see what she had found. Um, and she cut out all of the critiques. And eventually she started writing open letters in, in defense of herself. But for the most part, she held on to this. And this was really a kind of a, a lesson of, she was right, right? Then when she was hesitating to go public because she knew she was gonna be attacked. And then yes, she was attacked. But she took, the, she took away from these, a lot of lessons that she used in, in future after she made other discoveries. I'll, I'll pivot um, to her sister, Elizabeth Morris. Um, as I said, she worked behind the scenes a lot and she enjoyed um, helping scientists, especially find specimens. One of the, um, she was a, a, a specialist in ferns. She loved ferns and grasses too, for that matter too, but, um, and orchids. She loved a lot of things, but the um, ferns were one of her specialties. And she, um, when she started working uh, kind of behind the scenes uh, in support of Asa Gray, one of the major early botanists in the country, um, who was trying to create his career, he was not, he did not come from a wealthy background. He didn't, he wasn't self-funded. He, he was a farmer's son and he didn't have a lot of wealth. And so he was trying to make ends meet and he needed, he had the desire to turn Harvard's botanical garden and their herbarium into a major source of um, uh, native plants from the United States or from North America generally. And so he was trying to collect as much as he could, but he couldn't go on all those expeditions to find that stuff himself. And he didn't have money to pay for people to go and collect all these plant specimens. And so he really relied heavily on people like William Darlington, the man who had his papers at um, the New York Historical Society, where I stumbled on Elizabeth's papers, and also Elizabeth Morris, among other people. Eventually, he got enough clout and wealth from his position that he would be able to afford to have collectors collect for him. But in this early stage of his career, he really relied on kind of the free goodwill of others. And so Elizabeth Morris found, knew exactly where to find the Asplenium panoptifidum. It's a spleen wart, it's kind of fern. At the time, it was very rare, and it was, um, you could find it in the rocks um, in Philadelphia, right as where the Wissahickon Creek, this major creek that the, the sisters use as their laboratories and walking distance from their home, um, right where the Wissahickon Creek met, met the Schuylkill River. And in those rocks was able to, to find some of the Esquinium Phenotifidum and then also save some there so that they wouldn't be destroyed, that she could keep coming back and finding more of them. And um, she did that and then she sent the um, Asplenium Panoctifidum to Asa Gray, who then distributed them all around the, the world. So he was also trying to gain um, clout. And so what he did was he sent it to Kew Gardens to see if Joseph Hooker was interested in it, or William Hooker at the time was interested in it. And he was, he was writing a fern book and um, a, like a hundred, you know, the top hundred ferns of all this sort of stuff. And he, I will show you his illustration. Uh, so this is the, the um, uh, herbarium specimen of the of her from her collection that William um, uh, that Asa Gray sent to Kew Gardens and that's actually in, at Kew Gardens now on the left and then you have the illustration on the right side so her her material got dispersed and transformed and became educational in that way although the the credit disappears bit by bit too so you see at the bottom of the herbarium she is probably hard to see but it says Miss Morris there's a there's a collector's name but once you're in William Hooker's Century of Ferns there's no reference to it but he does reference the fact that it is very hard to find and so kind of takes a nod to that only only very serious collectors know how to how to locate this um, 
So that's the kind of work she's doing. She's also connecting botanists across the country. There's a young botanist who needs a job and he's looking for a position and she goes and contacts someone in Massachusetts and someone in Canada and tries to connect people. Again, all this network building. So you can see how these two sisters are working in very different ways. Margareta elbowing her way into debates, Elizabeth um, kind of behind the scenes connecting, and they came, came together really um, effectively in the, uh, at the end of the 1840s when Margareta made a huge discovery about cicadas. So 17, we're in a big cicada year this year, um, uh, but this, this is Brew 10. Brew 10 came out, there was another big, I'm, I'm very attuned to the cicada news, but there was a, a big, uh, the, the um, emergence of Brew 10 in 2021. And so that, that was another time where the cicadas were in the news. But that, so hers were part of what's now known as Brew 10. Um, what she and her sister had this beautiful botanical garden behind their house in Philadelphia, in the Germantown neighborhood of Philadelphia. And they had a lot of pretty good orchard, um, apples and pear trees. And um, their trees were suffering. They were not producing fruit. They were getting um, moss all up and down the bark. The, the leaves were not looking very good anymore. They were pretty much sure that their, their trees were dying. And so Margareta proposed that they um, have, go about an experiment in their orchard and see if, she, if her assumptions might be correct. When she was um, a young adult, she had witnessed the cicadas hatching um, out on the trees and then watched as the little um, baby cicadas jumped down off of the tree roots or off of the limbs and went down below the trees and started digging into their kind of subterranean uh, future. And she thought, well, maybe these cicadas are living off of the trees. Maybe they're on the roots of the trees and that's how they're subsisting. At this point, people didn't 100% know how cicadas subsisted underground for 17 years. They understood the 17 year cycle, but they, there was a kind of assumption that they were just benignly in the dirt, sort of absorbing nutrients somehow. There wasn't really a, a sense of how they were affecting trees or, and she was interested if they were um, kind of predators on the trees, if they were affecting the quality of the trees. Um, so what she did was she had her gardener dig a trench that looked kind of like what you see in the, the, the left-hand side of this um, image um, around the, the perimeter of the tree. And they dug out all the roots and then there, the plan was to fill this in with some good compost and to see what happened. If the tree died, the tree died, they were dying anyway, if, um, but maybe they'd make a discovery in the process. And as the um, gardener was digging out these roots, all of, um, things were appearing on the side in this pile and uh, she saw there were cicadas larvae all with their proboscises all um, in, in these roots digging deep in and clearly subsisting on the, the um, uh, xylem of the trees. And so, the, so she found that. And also something she found was that on the, the roots, she, there were some cicada larvae that were pretty big and there were also some that were small. At first she was like, well, maybe the small ones are starved relatives of the bigger ones. They're just kind of growing at different rates, but it might be a new species too. She had heard in 1817 at the prior, um, or 1834 at the prior emergence, she had witnessed how one of them behaved differently, had a slightly different sound and slightly smaller. Um, it would jump back quickly. It, 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 to her ear, it sounded like a stocking weaver, which is a very 19th century reference, um, specifically in Germantown where there were a lot of uh, woolen and, and other kind of industries going on. Um, so, and, and then it was different from the other cicada that made a sound kind of like faru is how she would describe it. So. She submitted all of this to the Academy of Natural Sciences, all these specimens, she kept sending them in. She had some that were alive and attached to the roots. She had others that she had jarred up. They had hundreds and hundreds of cicada. Every tree that they went to, they found the same cicadas. She sent this all in. She's like, I have this. This is, you know, whatever went wrong with the wheat fly debacle, now I have this under control. And her sister really jumped into action too by um, building up a network. She said, you know what you need is you need endorsers. You need people to come out and see what you're seeing and say that they're seeing what you're, they're seeing. So they, she brought in all these male scientists who were very famous in their field, um, uh, a traveling British um, scientist who was really great with microscopes, came to stay with them. They got 
got to see the the innards of a gizzard and whatever all this sort of stuff um, uh, in on with his microscope and then he witnessed this and he wrote a report on it. Um, Louis Agassiz very famously also came to their garden, what, witnessed the the emergence of the uh, kind of the a gardener coming and digging another tree up and Margarita was delighted that all her trees were suffering because that meant that she could keep doing this over and over again the more that people came. Um, so so. And the Louis Agassiz was incredibly powerful. He was Swiss, he had come to the United States. He was now the zoology professor at Harvard. He was making a tour. He's very controversial. He's, he's a um, kind of pseudoscience, like anti-black uh, sort of stuff that he's doing. He's looking at, he's spending most of his time in Philadelphia looking at skulls, trying to prove um, kind of white supremacy. Um, so, but he's also interested in cicada life cycles. They don't have 17 year cicadas in Europe and he wants to know more about what she's discovering. He ends up sponsoring her and he sponsors also Mariah Mitchell. So it's a really co complicated um, history there. He ends up becoming a supporter of women in science. His wife, um, later on, he marries a woman who is a, um, a major supporter of women's education. She heads Radcliffe College, all this sort. But he he's also doing that in this situation too. And so he endorses her and his endorsement is a huge one. And he, um, uh, and it, it just helps to silence a lot of those um, agricultural entomologists and the folks who had been um, very critical of her, at least to us an extent, it mutes it a little bit because you, she has big uh, people in her corner now. So it, you can see the ways that the two sisters are collaborating and bringing their different skills to this um, uh, with um, Elizabeth kind of working behind the scenes to, to create that sort of support network. So as, as I mentioned, there's this quote at the bottom here and it's just about how Margareta basically discovered this new um, species of cicada. Um, I am inclined to believe that there are two species differing sufficiently in size to account for the discrepancy in size of the larva now found. I noticed this difference in 1817 and again in 1834, the note of the smaller variety or species is much shriller than that of the larger and will never be mistaken when noticed. So she writes this to the Academy of Natural Sciences in 1846. And there are many reasons why these sisters were erased from the record. It's not, there's no one villain. It's like this accumulation of many things. So, but first is the naming of species. Um, and um, there is a, there's a, um, an algae or a seaweed that is named for Elizabeth Morris. She had discovered it and sent it to uh, a, a famous algae expert, in Dublin, and he named it for her. But other than that, there are no species named for these women, despite the fact that they discovered many. Um, this cicada species, um, Margareta had sent all those specimens into the Academy of Natural Sciences um, and uh, declared that she had discovered this new species, And but she's not in the room. Um, she wasn't a member, so she couldn't be there to be present as in the discussion of this. She's the only person sending cicadas into the Academy of Natural Sciences, but um, two men who were at the, who were members in 1846, when on the receiving end of this, in 1851, when there's the emergence of Brutes, um, Brute 10, or what we now call Brute 10, um, they just declared that they had discovered it and they named it for themselves. Um, so it's now known as Cason Cicada um, and uh, named for, for John Cason and James um, Cogswell Fisher, who's like, he gets some credit in that in the naming too. Um, so in some ways that the naming of species, now we have ornithologists um, have, have taken out human names from this and maybe that's even a better um, status. But um, scientific footnotes, this is a more, it's a, it's a drier path to discovering an erasure, but it was um, a way that I could see the ways that things that Elizabeth Morris or, or Margareta Morris had published gradually um, disappeared from records in footnotes. So um, the kind of crediting of scientists, over time you'll see if Margareta was writing about peach yellows, a disease that affects peach trees and the insects that might be involved with that or not involved with that, she would publish something and then 10 years later, there'd be someone who's publishing about peach yellows and he includes her reference. But then 20 years after that, it's, it disappears and, and eventually it's written out. Or one of these agricultural entomologists from the 1840s who was trying, who was feeling insecure about his own professional standing and decides that Margaret didn't know what she was talking about with the wheat flies. 
his, his word becomes golden. And that's the thing that keeps getting repeated over and over again by agricultural departments um, reports and things of that nature. Um, uh, so absence of obituaries and memorials there. Uh, Elizabeth got an obituary. She was um, a, a famously anonymous, I feel like that's kind of a paradox. Um, she was a very popular anonymous author in scientific journals and um, because of that, she was outed. She actually hated to see her name in print. She did not want any credit for the work she was doing. Um, again, two different careers and two different paths. Um, she, um, when she passed away, one of the journals that she wrote for the Gardener's Monthly, the editor of that wanted to give her credit. And so he outed her and told um, readers all of her pseudonyms, or at least the pseudonym she used in that magazine, um, which was helpful for a historian trying to, to uncover the path. Um, but Mar Margareta, despite being one of the women elected to these Academy, the Academy of Natural Sciences, the American Association, typically when scientists in those organizations passed away, they'd get a long form obituary, a memorial is what they'd call it, um, or memoir, excuse me. Um, which is it's basically a little biography, kind of a, a first draft of a biography of these people. She did not get that. Um, normally uh, scientists would use that as a way to be like, here's my friend. He's definitely one of the leaders of this field. He is the father of entomology, the father of zoology, the whatever, um, the, you know, the founding fathers. And that's the way that people, and that's what historians of science use. That's like the first draft. That's where you get started on a lot of these things. It also humanizes these people in a way that other kinds of records won't. So there'll be, if you looked at, at Louis Agassiz's um, memoir when he passed away, to talk about how he is red in the face and always a little fiery and all this sort of stuff, things that you don't get from other kinds of historical sources. Um, so she did not get that. And so in that way, that was an erasure as well. Archival collections, um, even to like very into recent history. I mean, in some ways it's helpful that they were related to a powerfully, a politically powerful um, and wealthy, well-known family because some of their stuff got into archives just because of that. But um, they, nobody was looking to collect their scientific papers specifically. It landed in the family and it stayed in the family for some time. Um, but for the most part, their, their collections were just like the letters that I was finding between them and other scientists, they're hidden in the papers of male scientists. They're, um, they were collected for some entomologist here or a botanist there. And I was able to, to uncover some of that because of digital um, digitization nowadays, which makes it a lot um, a lot easier to find these, to trace these needles in a haystack. But for the most part, for a long time, their collections weren't um, being sought out by archivists. Interestingly, in the 90s, um, a collector who had probably purchased it from a family was um, in New Hampshire, was looking to sell their papers, their scientific papers. So it's all the letters that they had received from scientists um, to any archive. And what he did to make it the most marketable, the, the sell it for the best price, is he looked through and found who was the big name in that collection. And it was Asa Gray. Is the biggest name. And he's the, again, this, the Harvard botanist. And he called it the Asa Gray Papers. And he ended up selling it to the Library of Congress, who bought it in 1999, so pretty recently. Um, and they, and they, the, the um, purchaser and the curator of the history of science at that time looked at that and decided that they weren't going to name this for the Morris sisters, despite the fact that the only thing holding that the set of papers together was that it was from the Morris sisters, um, and instead call it the Asa Gray papers. To this day, to this day, it's still referred to it that way. So the archival collections and naming, again, digitization though makes it possible to find this stuff because the brief descriptions that are there allow you to kind of uncover uncover that it's um, a lot of materials that were sent to the Morris sisters. And then finally, what you see in this slide is the demolition of their home. This was in 1915. A German town in Philadelphia um, specifically needed more high schools, and they were looking for property to build high schools. And initially, um, they they had found this block. It had this beautiful uh, garden. There were a, another other big houses on this block and with long stretches. And they purchased the block to build the German town high school. Um, it's where Bill Cosby went to high school, <laughs> another place. In the um, he, and they um, initially were going to save. The Morris House um, for its historical significance. Um, they were going to use it for home ec classes, which is uh, un unbeknownst to folks who are who are um, planning that for the the Philadelphia public school system. That it was actually ironic, or it was it was fitting because 
um, Elizabeth Morris used to write a lot of recipes and kind of home ec, um, arguing that that women were scientists even in the kitchen with their home ec stuff. And it was like a, an argument that home ec in the early 20th century would make, but um, it, was, it was they were a little bit ahead of their time, but they were gonna have home ec classes in this historic house. But then one of the preservationists in town who happened to live across the street from the high school, saw the high school with the, the historic house adjacent built there and decided he didn't like the looks of that. It just seemed to be a mar on this. And by the way, he had been doing, he was like one of the, he'd been writing a history of Germantown and he couldn't determine that there was any, this 1915 again, 1915 historic preservation was very much tied to George Washington slept here. Here's a tie to, you know, that kind of, those sorts of stories. It was all really colonial or revolutionary and, and how you're connected to political power that way. He couldn't determine that one of the early settlers in Germantown lived in their physical house. There was no immediate, there was, there was an attempt to tie them to Dolly Madison, but it was, it was a loose end. And he was like, this is, this house, these women are not historically significant. But, and so he kind of pivots quickly, gets the public school who didn't want to actually have to pay for the upkeep of this historic home behind him. And they tear down the house in 1915. And for a while, there was a, still a historic sign there. But now that historic sign lives behind an HVAC unit at the Germantown Historical Society. So the erasures, you can see that there's, there are, there was no one villain. There's this rogue preservationist who decides to change his mind. There's the insecure um, entomologists who are fighting uh, to tell to tell the world that Margareta was mistaken. There are all these little accumulations, and also just like the archival collections, uh, uh, you know, a guy trying to make the most money possible in marketing. You just see this kind of accumulation of small violences until these women were essentially erased from the historical record. But but it's not all sad. I'm not going to let because you can you can um, really look at this kind of story and be pretty depressed if you're looking at all these erasures and these violences and the kind of loss of legacy. Um, but there's hope for change. Uh, so in 2021, when uh, Brood 10 emerged in the East Coast, I wrote a, a short article about the naming issue of the cicadas for Scientific American um, and just it said, you know, actually Margareta Morris discovered this, um, the species, it shouldn't, it, and then John Kaysen stole the name from it. And um, they published it and immediately within like hours of it going online, uh, entomologists who are experts in cicadas um, reached out to me and they're like, we wanna correct the record. We wanna kind of work to change the, the common name of the cicada to be, instead of being called the Kaysen cicada to be the Morris's cicada. So who knows, maybe that'll be corrected. Um, we'll see. Um, and, and now the, all these, the, these um, entomologists run a bunch of websites uh, through University of Connecticut and elsewhere um, with all this information about the cicadas and they cite Margareta Morris and bring her in now too. So she's getting some credit that she has not gotten in for centuries. And, you know, I, as I said, I, a story about a race scientist like the Morris sisters, and there's so many, well, you know, there's quirky, very specific ways that they were erased, but you can see how this would apply to all any number of marginalized scientists who doesn't get the credit they deserve, whether for gender or race or other kinds of um, form of, of marginalization. But there's there's more to their lives, the Morris sisters, than their erasure. That wasn't actually a big part of their personal concerns. Margaret got really worked up about people telling her she was wrong and she kept files and she she defended herself and things of that nature. But they also just kept going at it. Like they weren't silence. They could have been, Margareta could have been silenced with the Hessian fly debate and just been like, you know what, I didn't want to be a public scientist anyway. I don't want to be. Instead, she was like, no, she just like kept going and continued and persevered with that. And um, in many ways, they also just continue to their, live their lives and continue to find joy outside. So they would often go off um, into the Wissahickon Creek or around Germantown into their, their neighbor's fields and farms in search of um, new discovery, something new to explore, something new to, to paint and describe, something new to share with the world. And they just continue to go outside and find that joy despite whatever noise was in the background about people looking for credit or taking these kind of um, moves of power. They just, they found joy outside in nature. Thank you. Catherine, thank you so much. That was just as a, just as a woman hearing these stories and uh, just Fascinating. And that you were a detective. You really were a detective. <laughs> and that they just kept knocking on your door saying, 
you know, hey, talk about us. Don't forget us. Right. That was wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Well, who's our number one? Rich. Very often in, in academics, it's the uh, it's the advisor of say the academic advisor of someone who who, who helps their their uh, students get along. Did these uh, women have a formal education? Did they have uh, mentors in uh, uh, say a university that that could could have done more to uh, promote them as scientists? Yeah. So it, they were women's seminaries or uh, seminaries were kicking up right as they were too old to really get engaged with them. So they, they just preceded that moment. So they weren't, they, it was, they preceded this sort of mentor, like many author kind of, that's another level of power relationship. It, in the sciences today, by far, um, right? And probably the most contested of those. Um, but no, yeah, no they, they didn't have, they couldn't go to college. Um, they, but they had basically the best education they could possibly have. There's some holes in the archive, so I don't exactly know precisely how, what their high, their, their high school or secondary education would have been. Um, but I know that their parents put a lot of money into their education from when their father died when they were in their toddlerhood and in the, his settling of his estate. I had all of the tutors and the, everything like that. They were very young at that point, kind of el early elementary school toddler age, but there, it was clear that all the sisters and the brothers were getting a good education. In their 20s, they had a whole bunch of tutors um, who were tied to that, that they would come in, they were friends of the people who lived at WIC, that house that I showed in the beginning with the wheat fly, mm -hmm. and they um, were the leading scientists of the time, um, at a time when men couldn't make a living in the sciences. Um, so it was pre-professionalization. So these people were living hand to mouth. They were sleeping under the skeletons in a natural history museum. Um, quite literally, there were multiple people who were tent like using the mastodon as a tent or the horse as a tent. Um, but they uh, they made money tutoring and that, that benefited the Morris sisters because they would come in and a, a, a famous um, illust a natural science illustrator from Paris was living in Philadelphia and would come to WIC and teach them how to paint um, and illustrate stuff. They, um, Margareta was tutored by Thomas Say, the kind of so-called founding father of American zoology and entomology. Um, Elizabeth Morris worked with Thomas Nuttall, the kind of early American, he was British um, uh, and, and um, a botanist, the kind of famous botanist of the era. So they were working with the kind of top people and so in that way, in this pre-university centered way, they had the best education that they could possibly have um, in that moment. So they, could they have been better supported? Yes, um, if, is the short answer of that. Um, Thomas Say dies in a utopia in, in Indiana um, at a young age before all this happens and um, before it kind of Margareta takes a public um, stance. And so I don't know if he would have supported her more. Her first venture into science though was with the wheat flies and basically saying, Thomas Say, you're wrong. <laughs> and um, and so I don't know if he would have supported that, but, um, but yeah, in any case, they could have received more support from all these um, these folks. Most of them had moved off to this utopia in Indiana, though New Harmony was the name of it. And so they um, weren't really available to to kind of support them in that way. They were kind of they thought they were creating this scientific um, utopia of high education and gender equality. And um, it ended up being a huge failure. And the women were doing twice the amount of work that they <laughs> were. They had to do everything and said and everything just fell apart. Um, and then people that started getting sick or like Thomas Say died of like five different things like malaria and, and <laughs> diphtheria and all these different things. So, um, so they could have been more supported, but their, their, their tutors were also otherwise engaged. <laughs> yeah. uh, we have a second, our second. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you for the, not just the presentation, but doing the work oh. and recovering this narrative because we know there's so many out there. Yeah. That, have yet to be unearthed. Uh, and so my question, I, you partially addressed it at the very end, but I'm also an academic and we, we know, and the first question alluded that there are still these great systems of marginalization in academia that, and there are even more, it's an even more crowded field now yeah. in every, in everyone's area. So what do you, from your field, when, from your academic area, what do you see as the insurances against some of this marginalization today? So Margaret Morris and Elizabeth Morris were in some ways 
they had more opportunities in their moment because it was pre-professionalization and it was before universities really absorbed a lot of the sciences and made it made the universities a central part because then women had to fight back their way back into it. Um, and so there was a gap in the middle there kind of after they passed away, they passed away in the, in the midst of the Civil War, they, um, Elizabeth in 1865, um, Margaret in 1867. And so there were opportunities in the, the lack of structure, um, kind of like the way that they, the, the lack of structure also provided them with tutors because they couldn't, the tutors couldn't make ends meet. Um, once it becomes more profitable, it, they are pushed out. In some ways, I think the fact that we push for that, there's even a mindset of like women should be in STEM, we should be supporting girls in STEM and math and stuff like that. That that I feel like is a plus. That I mean, I, I grew up of that generation, right, where where um, there were all these, you know, went to you know the, in high school went to a, a university kind of program for girls in math and girls in science, whatever. So I think in some ways there's that, but it's still it's a story that keeps continuing. There was the the um, the woman who I'm. Catalin, I'm forgetting her last name right now, the woman who discovered, was kind of central to the discovery of the COVID vaccine. She, um, she was really marginalized in her at University of Pennsylvania, had a basement office, was, and then she wins the, the Nobel Prize and um, gets elevated and um, becomes famous. And it's a, and then UPenn is like, oh, look at our scientists, when they had been, really been trying to edge her out for a long time too. So in some ways, it's just, it's, it just continues. I don't mean to be too cynical. I think there are, I mean, we, and we have more of an eye to these issues of social justice and equity in universities. And I know there are some universities who try to, to work for this. Um, and I know my own is trying to kind of fix the sort of culture in different uh, different departments and, of the, and that nature where, where kind of old systems and um, old behaviors have continued, but it's still an issue as with the listing of authors on an article and the mentor taking all credit or whatever when other people below um, him or her are giving, doing the labor. So it's a mixed bag, I guess. I don't know that there's a lot of assurances, but I think we have more eyes on it and we're more aware of it. And I think that's an assurance at least. I have a quick question. Sure. The, when she, the, the fly where she was, she had the correct knowledge, but was so, Everyone else, we all it was it that they all knew the eggs were on the leaf, and then she said no, it was on the, 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 seat, the seat. Yeah. So, what I mean, so how did that happen? I mean, would that open your eyes and see? Yes, and so actually, what ends I, I didn't actually get to the end of that. So I appreciate you, you yeah. um, bringing that up. So she actually had discovered a new species of wheat fly that was visually oh. indistinguishable from the Hessian fly. Um, there's something like six million uh, Hessian or Cecidomia flies out there that are these kind of wheat or um, grain-based flies that that um, eat that stuff, and we have named a 10% of them, a very oh. tiny portion of them. And she had discovered a new one and um, that was behaving differently, but the two were working in concert, basically. There was the one that was laying the, the seeds, uh, the, laying eggs on the leaf were still also affecting this, this crisis in different parts of the state, but she was in, in different parts of the East Coast, but she was witnessing something in Philadelphia that was very specific, mm -hmm. but people who were in upstate New York weren't necessarily yeah. believing her because they were like, what, what are you even talking about? We don't believe what you see. There was a lot of discussion of like believing observation or you, what you, what, you know, if, if you could trust her site rather than the farmer's site from upstate New York or the entomologist's site from Massachusetts or some, something like that, there's a trust and vision um, and observation that was part of it. But that that um, species, so she discovered that that um, new species of Cessinomia. She just she realizes that partway through the process that it wasn't that Thomas Say was wrong, but that she had found um, a new species and she submitted all of the the specimens to the Academy of Natural Sciences. But they actually left the specimens out on a table. Um, specimens of all, yeah, if you, like, like anything, like a garden, specimens are eaten by pests. There's lots of creatures in, in um, uh, natural history museums that will go and attack these things. And because it was left out, it was destroyed before anybody could validate that she had discovered something new. Um, and so that she had named a species for herself in the end from that and it was erased from history basically because of that that neglect and no, nobody has as best i could tell I, I spoke to a whole bunch of current experts on sesodomaya that work at the university of nebraska and elsewhere and they were like i can't pin what that actually is right now based on the description thank you the title of your book 
mysterious creatures, does that come from the writings of one of the sisters? No, no. So actually, the book was actually going to be titled Sister Scientists. That was the, but then a um, social, as social media being what it is, there's a, a social, a, a sister scientist account that took, popped up that's about like hair science. And I didn't want to step anywhere near, like I just let that be. And the, the, the chapter, the third chapter about Hessian flies was called Mischievous Creatures. Um, and that ended up becoming kind of the wordplay about the sisters and the, the um, subjects of their studies. Um, Can you tell the story about your- Oh, no. Oh, with- Okay. Yeah, we're so, okay. Number four is Joyce, I think. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. We'll do that one. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned difficulty with primary sources. I'm wondering if you could tell the story. Oh, oh yeah, there is a Portland story to this, um, which is pretty magic. Actually, um, uh, so this book, I was I was completing it in the midst of COVID and everything. And luckily, I had done most of my archival research. Um, uh, prior to the the um, kind of cessation of travel and everything like that, um, but I was on the playground. My, my kids um, my kids were in elementary school, and uh, there wasn't a lot of after school care at the time, so I was spending a lot of time on the playground talking to other parents and making small talk with a dad. And he was telling me about his insurance business, and I was telling him about my um, my book. And he asked me the name of the scientist, as everybody would do. They were I was like, I'm talking, I'm writing about two scientists that have been erased, and they're like, maybe I've heard of them, you know, whatever. And um, so I, I, I mentioned the name and then months later, we're back on the playground. He's, he comes up to me and he said, I think I might be related to those scientists. Now, all of my archives are on the East Coast. I'm, I work with you know, stuff in Boston and Philadelphia and Delaware, um, you know, Cambridge and, and um, England, whatever. It's all East Coast based or, or Atlantic at least based materials. Nothing was in, nothing was e easily local to me, but he not only was related to them, he was descended from their brother but his uncle lived in, lives in Hood River and had one of Margareta's books in his attic. It was like a historian's dream of uh, uncovering this. Um, and uh, it was, you know, we had all just been vaccinated. And so he invited me into, he worked for the US Forest Service, he and his wife, and they invited me into their, their home. And I got to see this um, um, amazing uh, uh, album that had Margareta's art and her poetry. It happened to be, I was writing the, and I, I had kind of sim a similar book for Elizabeth that's at the University of Delaware, but I had not seen this one. Um, Margareta was very, kept her cards very close to her chest in general, uh, personally. It happened to be, I was writing the, the last, one of the last chapters of the book when the two sisters pass away. And they, they Elizabeth passes away first. So she's the older sister. She passes away in 1865. And then I had very few records minus Margareta's will. <coughs> that was the only thing. Um, uh, and she basically stopped publishing or producing materials. This album though had, and I was in the midst of writing that, I'm like, how am I gonna deal with Margareta's grief? I don't have any sources, you know, it's all gonna be speculation, I'm not sure what to do. Um, but this book had her poetry about grief and it had a painting she had done in, on, um, to, on her sister, the anniversary of her sister's death, that ends up being on the book. Or, and the, um, the cover has some of the paintings from the book on it too. Um, it was just, it was amazing. And I still can't wrap my mind around this uh, discovery. It's just, it was sort of like, I, and I, it was like a historian's, you know, Christmas or something like that. Like I, I would, the, the, but my, the, the dad on the playground was very low key about it. Like he, he didn't immediately get me in touch with his uncle. And I was just like, no, no, no. Have you, have you been in touch with your uncle? Like, has he, you know, ever, like, I'm like, this is, this is an amazing uh, discovery. And yeah, I don't, I don't know what to make of it other than not to ever, like I, I talk too much about my projects as it is, but I will never stop talking about them now. If it's, it's a possibility of leading to these kinds of discoveries. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's going to be donated. I think he's working to donate it to the University of Delaware so that it can re reunite the materials with uh, the sisters' materials. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I think we're at question four now. Yes. Are you in heaven or are you in a different <laughs> trajectory? I, I'm, 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 I'm in discussions with a, um, a biologist at, you know, at Portland State, one of my colleagues, who um, can speak to the, the, the science behind invasive species and the kind of um, probing into, like, that sort of end of it, because he, he's also interested in the ways that we define plants as villains um, and, and plants and other creatures um, as villains and sort of pushing back on that a little bit. And so I think we're going to co-write something, um, at least an article, who knows, uh, 
yeah, yeah. Did you say that that tree that was considered a weed mm -hmm. or invasive was the book, was the tree from the tree that grows in Brooklyn? It is, yes. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It comes it comes in and out of favor. Okay. Um, it's seen, it was introduced into the United, it's a Chinese tree, tree of heaven, um, introduced to American cities in the 1820s because of heat, because of it was trees weren't typically these didn't have trees in the streets, they were seen as obtrusive to traffic. Mm -hmm. Um, and so most trees were cut down, then they were reintroduced as a way to up real estate values and also to prevent, you know, in a time before air conditioning to yeah. have, you know, to do what we've now relearned again, mm -hmm. that it's important to have these trees around the city. Um, uh, could you, why is it at times considered an invasive tree? Is it just- It takes off. So if anyone, I saw, I saw some knowing nods in the audience here. If, if you cut it down, if you decide, well, first off it smells bad. And so like in, in June for like two weeks when um, the male version of the tree lets out a, a smell that smells like a public restroom. Um, and in the 19th century at a time before germ theory, it was seen as uh, causing illnesses. People would write into newspapers saying, I got the flu, my family has the flu, and it's clearly from that tree on the street, um, the, that sort of stuff. So that that was one layer of hatred towards it. The fact that it was Chinese at a time when there was a lot of anti-Chinese bigotry anyway was another one. And then nowadays, if you try to cut one of these things down, it goes into emergency zone, uh, mode and like has suckers that come out. So it's in, almost impossible to get yeah i'm seeing some of them. um it's hard it's hard to get rid of it's also very much seen it's like the trees that grow in less maintained spaces so you'll see it growing beside a um uh it's, it's tagged with light let's just say and so there's many ways that we subconsciously kind of make it a villain um and trees that we can't control trees that don't have a major economic value we tend to make it more villainous too but it might be actually it's a type of resilient tree that can do stuff in during climate change too and, and absorb a lot of um carbon so there's there's stuff that we should reconsider it just that book is i love that book and that, all, that, that to know that about that tree yeah. is thank you very much yeah I mean, it's a it's a symbol of immigrant resilience right in yeah. that book too yeah, and, it's, it and it is an immigrant and it's yeah. resilient thank you yeah okay question let's see oh we've got uh, one from uh our Zoom audience, Suzanne, can you come in, please? Yes, hi there. Thank you, Catherine, for this good topic. Um, I love the picture of the fern, and we don't, I've never seen a fern like that. It's very beautiful. Yeah. And we live in the land of ferns in the Northwest. Yeah. So I'm, it made me think, well, what is our best school, uh, our top school for entomology or the study of plants? Do we have a really top rate educational place for stu That's a good students. Question. I mean, I will always vouch for Portland State having amazing uh, um, folks uh, in the faculty uh, in the, the biology department. So that, that would be a good place. And there's there are fern, there's a fern expert and a moss expert as well um, as an entomologist there too. So I, um, that, that's very local. And um, I, I don't know if you all, do you, I'll, I'll just give a little shout out for PSU. Do you know about the senior auditor program there that you, mm -hmm. it's amazing. So anyone over 65 can take classes for 25 bucks. You get into every class that you want um, as long as you get the permission of a faculty member. It's amazing um, online or, or in person. So that, that's um, a great program. Um, but I mean, all of our, I think there's so many strong science programs in Oregon and Washington state too, for that matter. Um, uh, you can't go wrong. I don't, I don't think that any of these public institutions or Reed or Lewis and Clark, you're going to find some good folks who, who are good for that. Thank you. Uh, qu uh questioner five. You could five. Okay. Leslie, go oh, ahead. Yeah. Slightly off topic, but <clears throat> did the wheat fly? Well, what was the uh, uh, pest control at time? And did the wheat fly usher in DuPont's DDT? And I don't know when that came. Yeah. So, I mean, actually, the wheat fly is still day defy. For the most part, if you if you go on to any of the agricultural schools extension center websites <laughs> that tell you how to manage it, it still is about planting things at various points in the year to avoid the the um, uh, 
the perfect conditions for the fly to kind of emerge. So it didn't, it, it didn't exactly, it didn't tie into DuPont, like the DuPont would have no power over it even now. Um, it still is something that evades um, uh, pesticide control. At the time when Margareta was playing with it and trying to figure, solve the problem, there was the idea that you could get wheat from other locations that hadn't been infested and that that would be a way. If you had Mediterranean wheat, at least for a year or two, it would prevent you from having to deal with the Hessian fly. That wasn't a long-term solution. It was mostly about planting times and making sure you planted X number of weeks before or after the frost to avoid the, the fly from really having a, a good space to, to grow. Um, so it's one of those, yeah, it, 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 there's no direct relationship to, to um, chemical fertilizer or pesticides, um, though there are for all varieties of reasons. There's, um, oh, there's some good books about that and the ties to war too, specifically. Um, I, can't, I can't remember if it's Greg Mittman or, oh, I'm blanking. Um, I think it's Ed Russell actually has a book about, um, uh, Edmund Russell has a book about uh, the pesticides and the ties to to warfare and um, the the kind of um, control of of pests and control of of other peoples um, in that way. And then there's a question: Could you please spell the name? Was it spell the name of the tree, please? I think the scientific name of the oh sure yeah. of the tree of heaven. Yeah. So the tree of heaven is also called the ailanthus, and it's a i. L A N T H U S. It's like the spelling bee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like a <laughs> uh, Catherine, when when you know these 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 sisters were not allowed in to meetings, they, they just to present. And that's part of that's such a serious part of the problem. Oh, they yeah. couldn't present their work. Um, when when did that change? That women. Yes. could get access to these meetings. So, uh, and so I, as I mentioned at the beginning, Mark became a member of these two organizations with the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Academy of Natural Sciences. What's interesting, I um, found her membership card for the Academy of Natural Sciences. She became a member in 1859. So not, she was pretty old at that point. She um, was in her 60s. It was, she was only going to live another eight years beyond that. Um, she... Um, so she wasn't in the, at the heart of her career anymore, is what was in short. But that said, they had a rule, a membership rule, where you, if you were living in Philadelphia, you had to pay dues, and that would allow you to be in the room and make decisions. They had celebrity scientists that they would give corresponding memberships to, and they would be living in London, or they'd be living in Charleston, or wherever, and they would have these kind of gesture memberships. So it just it kind of elevated, but um, they didn't have to pay dues. They, when they elected Margareta, they specifically gave her a type of membership, like the celebrity ones, even though she lived in Philadelphia, they gave her the membership that they said they were doing this as a favor to her. They had to bypass the bylaws and all this sort of stuff. Um, but it meant she couldn't even be in the room, even at that point when she had membership. Things changed in the 1870s after the Civil War. The um, American Association for the Advancement of Science gets this huge rush of women who are joining. Um, a lot of women who went to say Vassar and other um, seminaries and places like that, they were you know, the rising um, in, in the sciences and they went to join in mass to the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It's major um, national, it still maintains that national um, kind of conference that would move around from city to city. And they, when, when there was this huge rush of women, suddenly the, um, uh, the leaders decided to make a, a kind of a hierarchical structure to their membership um, and made sure that there was like a certain higher level, which were the working scientists, um, the professional scientists, and that women were then kind of more, more or less kind of pushed to the bottom unless they were a professor somewhere, which was pretty rare. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 it picks up after the Civil War, but um, with a lot of, with an asterisk next to it where people were still kind of um, pushing them down a little bit. And without a fail, I should say, add in here, I'm talking about gender, but like with race was, that's a, like almost completely no, um, yeah. there was no diversity that way um, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's the same. And so very mimicking in the sciences of medicine. Oh, sure. It's yeah. very similar to, to but the, today, the graduating classes of surgeons that come out of Emanuel and OHSU are primary, are majority are women. Yeah. Yeah, which is such a change, such a change in that. Um, 
uh, when I first joined the American Burn Association, I had to get um, Dr. Parsley to give me permission to join the American Burn Association as an occupational therapist. It was the, the, the surgeons who were all men at the time were the members. And then we had like an associate member. Well, that's all changed now. Yeah, yeah but it's, it's parallel. Yeah. parallel yeah. Sure. And that, but that would have been in the eighties yeah. where it was still the surgeons and very, very, very few women were surgeons at the time. And then now it's just, and even, um, uh, survivors, which it was like they, they really can't show up. Those survivors that experienced a burn, they they certainly can't be a member. And now that's all changed. Anybody can, and survivors are an important part of the American Burn Association. Huh. Yeah, which I thought was, yeah, and I, you know, just these women, though, even though they were of wealth and raised as proper ladies, yeah, they had to go out in the field. Oh yeah, they were out all the time. They that's, that's pretty different. That is, and yeah. they they um they wrote extensively in these in, for these um agricultural journals, these popular science magazines about how women. Because if you looked at any kind of ornithology guidebook or botany guidebook, there'd be information about what should a man wear if he goes off on an expedition. Like what should you know? Where, it was often wear like these military coats that have lots of pockets so you can store your specimens in them, things like that. But it was stuff that wasn't available for women. There was no advice for women about what they should wear if they wanted to. So the Margaret and Elizabeth would write articles about like, look at these rubber boots that are geared towards men that you only, you don't see them in the fashion magazines. They're not in Godey's Lady Book or other kind of 19th century fashion magazines, but the, they're, the advertisements are all like military men and fishermen and whatever. Like, get those rubber boots. Mm -hmm. And um, Margaret had no qualms about wearing rubber boots. She loved them. She knew how to patch them with sassafras or something. They're, they're very good. Like, mm -hmm. I, if you want some homemade recipes about patching your rubber boots in the winter, um, I, I have them for you. Um, but the, uh, Elizabeth was terrified. Like she, she was like, I don't, these things are so ugly and they can't, they keep popping out from under my skirts. But, but anyway, they wore this stuff and they would tell you how to go about, they were not bloomer where they were not radical social radicals, like the folks who would wear bloomers, but like the early pants for women. Um, there were people who were making arguments for bloomers were for people who wanted to go and botanize and yes. so that they, they could climb over the rocks and go over the fence that they needed to or ford the river to get to the other side to get the orchid that they were after um it was often those sorts of practicalities in terms of clothing elizabeth designed a wheelbarrow that she could manage so that it wouldn't get caught in her skirts so there's like a lot of different things and kind of the practicalities of it when you have to be wearing these big skirts They're heavy they were heavy heavy and also wearing horses you know giving yeah. giving tips about wearing thick uh, fabrics that wouldn't snag on thorns and uh, yeah. that sort of stuff when you're hiking yeah. um so interesting and do you know anything about their mother i mean to have their mother not to let these girls after they were 11 you know marriaging age yeah. to be out in the woods that's pretty it's pretty rare it is and their their mother was um well educated at an abolitionist school herself mm -hmm. and um uh and just kind of kept supporting that um and for her daughters too mm -hmm. and there was just a lot of there they came from a quaker and an episcopalian background but the quakers saw women's spirits as the equivalent of men's spirits and so that there was that push to it their great aunt was this woman named Elizabeth Powell, and she was a major real estate mogul of the 18th and 19th century. And she, and, and that's where a lot of their wealth came from, because when her, their father died, the, the great aunt bought their house for them and bought all this stuff for them and supported them. But whenever you see tracks of about girls' education in the early 19th century, um, there are often dedications to Elizabeth Powell because uh, as a supporter, as a, an endorser of that too. So they came from a background of, of a lot of uh, kind of a push for women's education. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me tell you, is there any other, any other questions before we close? This has been just lovely. Thank you Thank so you. much. We've all enjoyed it immensely. Thank you. Thank you.